Hello and welcome to Dialogue. From the bombing of a U.S. consulate in Damascus to the raid of a Mexican embassy in Quito and the killing of more than 200 humanitarian workers in Gaza, are we entering a stage where international norms and the laws are under attack? At the same time, the U.S., a permanent U.N. Security Council member, redefined the Council's resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire as unbinding. Arguably the first time in U.N. history. Is international law no longer binding? Is the current international order declining? And how can we protect international order to promote peace around the world? Join us for our discussion today, live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Radhika Desai, professor at the Department of Political Studies at University of Manva, and Peter Kuznick, professor of history at American University, Andrew Latham, professor of international relations and political theory at McAllister College, and Anna Tangin, senior fellow at Taihe Institute. Welcome to Dialogue. So Radhika, we'll start with you. Uh, if you look at the world, I think everybody is aware of uh, the ongoing at least two wars in Gaza, in Ukraine, and of course conflicts in other parts of the world. And the recent bombing of the Iranian embassy and also the, raided, uh, the raiding of the embassy of Mexico uh, in Ecuador. So what's going on? I mean, how do you characterize the current international relations here? Well, I think that uh, the, the way, the best way to characterize current international relations is that when the post, when the Cold War ended, everyone expected that the world would become unipolar and enjoy a peace dividend. Unfortunately, thanks to the economic path pursued by the United States, which we may call neoliberalism, its economy has uh, failed essentially to uh, stand up to the test of, of, the, of Chinese growth in particular, and of course the growth in other BRICS countries and so on. And the, the, it has reacted to their growth, particularly China's growth, well, very badly. And so instead of a peace dividend as well, you have, we have had rising militarism throughout the period. At the same time, today, the United States' ability to control what happens in the world is rapidly declining. And as a consequence, we have this current chaos in which the United States continues to pursue the impossible dream for, for the United States, the impossible dream of dominating the world order. So even though it continues to fail, it continues to pursue it. Hence the militarism, the chaos, the, um, uh, yeah, the, and, 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 the, and the lawlessness internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, in your opinion, what are the major factors uh, you know, contributing to the, today's uh, international, uh, let's say international relations, which is far from ideal, right? I agree very much with what we just heard. Uh, it's the failure of the United States to accept the multipolar world. The United States, especially once the Soviet Union collapsed, the U.S. proudly proclaimed itself the unipolar power proudly asserted its hegemony and thought that it could get away with this kind of domination forever. In 2002, Charles Krauthammer said his early prediction of 30 to 40 years of American hegemony was wrong and it was going to last indefinitely. Well, things unraveled with Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Ukraine, things unraveled. And the problem is the U.S. does not understand diplomacy anymore. There's a dearth of diplomacy in the world right now. Uh, and so what we see is polarization, military blocks being built up again, uh, strengthened the, the kinds of military exercises and spending that's going on now and planning for war is insane in a nuclear armed world. But that's what the leaders are doing. We see the meetings between Lavrov and Wang Yi on the one side and the meeting in Washington now between Biden, Kishida, Marcos, while, while the war games are going on in the Pacific and in Europe, uh, we are just moving inexorably toward wo World War III. And there are no statesmen of enough stature right now to say what's going on and to call a halt to it. We desperately need diplomacy. Mm, we need diplomacy and uh, we need uh, better protection of embassy in the first place, probably before that. Aina. Uh, what's your take? 
Uh, it's the, uh, this marks the failure of American exceptionalism, and you have to kind of ask yourself why. Why has uh, America changed so drastically since it thinks? And, and it comes really down to one thing. They have not been taking care of the home front over the last 45 years. Uh, the number of Americans who are considered middle class went from 62% to 50%. You have polarization within the country. I mean, you know, the, the irony here is the richest, most powerful country on earth believes that it is a victim of the rest of the world. And the rest of the world doesn't, isn't really buying into it. So this kind of leadership that was uh, created after World War II has, in essence, dissipated. And that's due to American actions uh, undermining um, you know, the, the institutions like the WTO by refusing to allow uh, any uh, appellate judges. Therefore, there can be no finality to any of their agreements. Breaking uh, treaties at will, uh, withdrawing from treaties, uh, ignoring uh, the obvious when it comes to things like uh, Gaza, uh, pretending that there is no war crimes going on. These are the types of things which have completely separated, in danger of completely separating the U.S from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and that, uh, in the sense uh, of uh, the, the only superpower. Uh, Professor Andrew Latham, you, know, you wrote recently that the rise of a populist leaders, the erosion of a global trade partnerships, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Gaza war, and the specter of a renewed great power competition all paint a picture of an international order on the verge of a collapse. So we are on the verge of a collapse, and uh, is there any any sign that uh, things would be, uh, could be stabilized if uh, maybe if getting better would be even uh, welcome? Yeah, um, first of all, I found myself in broad agreement with my colleagues, uh, especially about the importance of diplomacy. And we've seen uh, international orders come and go ever since the ever since the Westphalian moment and the birth of the uh, an, you know the, the state-based international system. Um, think back to the aftermath of the French Revolution. Metternich and um, uh, other diplomats at the time got together and they had a, a sound understanding of the distribution of power and they created this Congress, um, which was both formal and informal, and they maintained world peace for about 100 years. Uh, it wasn't an entirely peaceful time. It was an era of European colonialism and there were um, minor uh, conflicts on the continent, but nothing major, nothing like the Napoleonic Wars. And then that, that broke down. And, and led to 1914 and the First World War. After the First World War, uh, uh, state leaders, uh, diplomats, misread the distribution of power in the international system, and they misread the possibilities for peace. And they deluded themselves into thinking that the League of Nations and the Kellogg-Briand Act, which banned international war, was going to solve all the problems. And that world order persisted for 20 years, in crisis for 20 years, and failed ultimately in 1939. And then when the US, the victorious United States Western allies, um, uh, built a new world order in the aftermath of the Second World War, uh, it was meant to be global. It was meant to be the original unipolar moment. Unfortunately, the Cold War broke out, and that was the end of that. And we had this bipolar distribution of power um, for, what, four decades or so. And then, um, yes, Charles Krauthammer's infamous unipolar moment, right? The United States emerging at the end of the Cold War, the Soviet Union disappearing as the sole remaining superpower, or as the French like to refer to us, the hyperpower, which has different valences, as you might imagine. Um, they kind of got it right, even if we don't like neoliberalism and we don't like the way in which uh, liberal democracies were forcibly exported and defended against threats like ISIS and Al Qaeda. Um, the system did not degenerate into a global a World War III. Now, though, we're at the cusp of another transition, and I don't see any Metternichs around the table. Um, we are transitioning from the unipolar moment to an era of multipolarity and multi alignment. And we have institutions that don't coincide with that balance of power. And we have a dearth of, of uh, diplomats and, and leaders with the vision to understand that this is not 1991 or 1999. It's not even 2005. This is a very different world. And unless they and we come to grips with that and, and construct an appropriate institutional architecture, um, I'm afraid World War III is not inconceivable. Mm -hmm. Well, very different world. Uh, so, uh, Radhika, 
in a very different world, does that give uh, you know, some national governments this impunity uh, in, let's say, uh, defying the international law, especially the law protecting the embassy, uh, the safety of the embassy or the embassy staff? Uh, for example, in the bombing of the Iranian embassy in Damascus, uh, we don't see much contamination, for example, from the UN Security Council members, you know, France, uh, the UK, and particularly the US. Nine of them expressed the contamination for such behavior. What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, first of all, let me just, if, I, if you don't mind, I just, I, I love the discussion that has gone on so far. It's really been very rich. But I'd just like to introduce two quick points to, to the previous discussion, if you don't mind. And that is, so that I, I agree that uh, what we need is diplomacy. And where the, we find absolutely no diplomacy is precisely on the side of the United States and the West. And, and the reason is very simple. You can't be, you can't have diplomacy unless you're willing to bargain. Bargain. But the West is unwilling to bargain. It has basically said it's our way or the highway. You basically accept the neoliberal order or as, you know, and, and, and essentially our right to do whatever we want. And the second is that it's not, I'm not sure it's true that there are no statesmen or that there is no vision of a, a stable order. I, I would say that uh, on the side of, the Ch of China in particular, but also Russia, I think, and also there is a wider understanding among many countries that have joined this organization, which is the group of friends of the UN Charter, etc. There is a broad understanding that the basic principles on which the United States, United Nations was created are correct. That is the way we should go. That involves accepting multipolarity or what I also like to call following Hugo Chavez pluripolarity, the ability of every country to organize its economy uh, in its own way. So I think that the vision is there and I think there are also uh, uh, important diplomats like Wang Yi, like Sergei Lavrov, who are in fact trying to pursue that, but we don't have cooperation from the other side. Now to come back to your question, uh, precisely, yes, of course, uh, you know, the bombing of the embassy, the refusal to acknowledge that there was something wrong with that uh, on, the, on the side of the United States. The, it's part of the United States backing of Israel. The ba United States backing of Israel is part of the larger failing strategy of U.S. and Western hegemonism because Israel is a central part of it. You know, while I have no doubt that the Israel lobby is very strong in Washington, I think that there is a greater explanation than just the Washington lobby for the U.S.'s unreasoning support for Israel because Israel is the United States cat's paw in the, in the Middle East. And so the United States has continued despite the, despite the enormity of world public opinion, which insists that there should be a ceasefire. The United States says, you know, on the outside, out of one side of its mouth that there should be, you know, an end to the ceasefire, there should be humanitarian aid, etc. While on the other hand, continuing to supply the weapons with which the carnage is being conducted even as we speak, and even the weapons with which the embassies of other countries are being attacked. The United States is really uh, here the, the principal rogue state. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Peter, uh, basically what you are seeing is like, uh, you know, uh, the politicians are talking out of uh, both sides of the mouth, uh, you know, as uh, Radhika mentioned, you know, on one hand, they expressed the concern, uh, you know, to the humanitarian situation in Gaza. At the same time, they are continue with weapons supplied to uh, Israel. Uh, so. Uh, you know, don't, don't they understand that there's an you know, overwhelming call internationally for ceasefire? Yes, I mean, the, the global community is horrified by what's going on in Gaza right now. And Biden's behavior is not only blind, it's also self-destructive. I mean, I'm a professor in the United States. I see what's going on on campus. I see what's going on with young people. According to the latest polling I saw, Trump is actually up amongst people under the age of 30 by 58% to 40%. And so uh, it, it, Biden is, is threatening to lose this election because of his blind, unwavering support for Israel, which most Americans find to be excessive and unethical and the world community is appalled by this the united states is supplying 70 percent of the weapons to israel on top of the financial aid that it gives to israel and so biden 
might criticize what Netanyahu is doing, but he's still uh, legitimizing it and still, in fact, making it possible to happen. So this kind of hypocrisy uh, is, is obvious to the global community right now. And from an American standpoint, to see the United States playing such a destructive role, not only here, but also in the Indo-Pacific, also, in my view, with Ukraine right now, uh, is that the United States, as Martin Luther King said a long time ago, the greatest warmonger on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Professor Andrew Latham, you know, you uh, wrote about the rules-based international order. I mean, the U.S. and the West in general has uh, often talked about the importance of following the rules-based international order. Do you also see, you know, at least occasionally, uh, if not frequently, uh, violation by the Western governments, by the Western countries, for example, in the case of Gaza? Yeah, well, a couple of comments um, in, related to that, that question, one of which is uh, it is always the hegemon's right to break the rules. <laughs> we don't like that. Um, but um, during that unipolar moment, the United States was, um, was always breaking uh, the rules that it established. So it was the rule maker, but it was also the rule breaker. And uh, that was tolerable sort of for the 30 years or so of the unipolar moment, but it's not anymore. And it's not anymore um, with respect to, um, you know, the, the way in which the United States expected the entire planet to rally in support of Ukraine. And the global south basically said, this is just another European war. Um, why? We, we're not, we're not going to march in lockstep with the United States on this. Because the sense that, and especially when the Gaza uh, war broke out, the sense that the United States in particular was really concerned about uh, norm violations, um, Russia invading Ukraine, when it suited their purposes. But when it didn't suit their purposes with respect to Israel, then, you know, turned a blind eye or actively encouraged uh, and supported Israel. The other brief comment I would make is, and I would quote Antonio Gramsci here, uh, he, he talked in the 1930s, uh, 20s and 30s about this is a time of change and the old world is dying, the new world is struggling to be born, this is a time of monsters. That's where we are today, this is a time of monsters. A, 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 a sort, a, a, the United States, many within the Beltway still think that this is the unipolar moment and or they think that this is the we're on the verge of a new bipolar cold war cold war 2.0 to quote neil ferguson um I, th I think there's a great deal of confusion in washington uh i don't actually share uh, my friend radica's um optimistic view of uh, uh, enlightened statesmen in other parts of the world understanding this moment any better it is a time of monsters we're all struggling to come to grips with it one hopes it happens sooner rather than later Mm, well, a type of monster, uh, does that mean like, uh, you know, countries can get away from uh, whatever, you know, they are doing uh, or, 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 you know, do, do they don't expect probably or they don't expect, uh, say, a closer look or scrutiny of their policy or behavior. And, then, you know, if you look at the UN Security Council, for example, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the uh, only uh, resolution uh, passed in the UNSC uh, calling for immediate ceasefire, and the U.S. abstained, uh, which makes, made it possible you know, as a resolution. And then right after that, the U.S. says, oh, it is not binding. <laughs> this well, is rare. <laughs> it's only binding when it's, uh, you know, according to U.S. wishes. Uh, you know, the, the hypocrisy that's been talked about, the fact that if you was not the United States, you would say it's a rogue state that is funded by a Ponzi scheme. Uh, the indictment of the U.S. is its own fault. Uh, we have, for many years, not taken care of our own. Uh, we're now thrashing out. Uh, we see the rise of China with a different system. We see it as a threat. We don't, we're not happy about the, you know, the fact that you know, there are no extreme poverty in, in China. Instead, we see it as a threat, the same way we saw Japan as a threat when it was rising during the 70s. So this inability to allow others to have their own path is now too old. 
Uh, we are in the midst of a paradigm change, and as my colleagues pointed out, the U.S. is still clinging to the old paradigm while the new paradigm has already arrived. And the question is, will there be conflict, uh, I was pointed out, because of that? Will that desperate need to maintain hegemony, even in the face of uh, world condemnation, uh, result in the U.S. using its last card, which would be the military card? Uh, ironically, though, the military is not th the same force it was. I mean, in Afghanistan, the whole might of the United States Army was brought to bear, and they were chased out of a country by 40, 50,000 people uh, who had, you know, basically very, very limited armaments. So at this, this, at this juncture, you know, as I would agree, chaos is reigning. The question is, is there something better? I mean, we've pointed out the problems, but I would disagree uh, with this idea that there are not enlightened statesmen. <clears throat> And this isn't because, uh, you know, I'm in China. I just simply say this idea that you can run a world that I'm right and you're wrong and you're either with me or against me doesn't work. I do think the three principles that have been put forward of security, development, and civilization, respect, uh, this, these are the things that are necessary to be uh, some way in which the world can, in fact, get along without saying you're right or wrong. Just simply say, let's agree to these very basic things, and if we can, we can construct a better world. The question is, will the U.S. go along with it? Mm -hmm. Well, Radhika, you're nodding your head, uh, seeming to agree with this idea of like basically peaceful coexistence despite all the differences, for example, in political system, in history, in culture, we can still like take care of each other and work together to build a, at least a you know, safe and peace, uh, peaceful international order there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Andrew mentioned something that I should have mentioned, you know, when I said that there's, there's a vision of a different international order, it's contained in this uh, document, you know, produced by the group of friends of the UN Charter. It's in the UN Charter, but it's also in this slew of documents that China has recently put out, including, you know, uh, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, the Global Civilization Initiative. All of these are important documents. They contain a different vision. And I would say that the best word for this new vision is actually a word coined by the late Hugo Chavez, because already before he passed away, there was much talk of multipolarity. And he pointed out that I he said he said he preferred the term pluripolarity because it signified the right of different countries to pursue their own uh, plan for their own development based on their history their institutions their resources their capabilities their needs and so on and I would say that uh, this is exactly what the U.S. refuses to accept, because while I agree with my colleagues that the U.S. United States is refusing to accept China's rise, the U.S. has also historically and today refuses and ref refused to accept historically and today refuses to accept the right of countries like Cuba or Venezuela or Iran or where have you, North Korea and many other countries to run their country on the basis of the the, of, of the plans and principles that are best for themselves. And this refusal has been the basis of practically all the aggression that we have witnessed. Because the purpose of the United States, shall we call it US imperialism, has been to try to open up other countries' economies so that it is open to, uh, on the one hand, U.S. corporations, their commodities, their capital, but also open to supplying these corporations with the cheap goods and the cheap labor that they require. So I would say this is the vision that the U.S. has pursued. Other countries now are willing and able to stand up to that. Because remember, China, of course, and Russia are mighty states, but even smaller states, uh, it is, it's, it's been difficult for the United States to even dominate states like Afghanistan. How is it going to try to, uh, you you know, uh, 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 conquer or subjugate, otherwise subjugate powerful countries like Iran or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, Peter, you know, the, uh, let's say the impunity, the practice of impunity, basically, you know, after bombing the embassy or reading an embassy or, uh, you know, killing this about 200 humanitarian workers, there's no consequence. Will that somehow, you know, make it worse in a time of monsters? Yeah. It, it, it's hard to imagine it getting worse, but it's getting worse by the day. Uh, everybody's digging in their heels. And the U.S. is, instead of looking for diplomatic off-ramps, beefing up all of its military alliances. And you look at the consequences. This meeting going on now 
today with Kishida and Marcos here in Washington with Biden. Japan is doubling its military spending. The Philippines has just given the United States access to four more bases. We remember a couple decades ago, three decades ago, when the Philippines threw the United States out of Philippines and the bases. Now the United States is back in. The United States is strengthening the AUKUS relationship. And Japan is talking about getting into AUKUS now also, in addition to giving Australia the nuclear submarines. We've got the, the quad being strengthened as well. Uh, there was just a big setback yesterday for U.S. plans in the region uh, because uh, Radhika is talking about how can the U.S. do this given its weakness in Afghanistan. Well, the U.S. is doing this by relying on partners and beefing them up. If there is fighting over Taiwan, the U.S. plan is not to go in there alone. It's to go in there with Japan, go in there with South Korea, and they're increasing the interoperability of all of these militaries throughout the region. And that's what these war games are about that are taking place now. So the U.S. is trying to build up and rely upon its partners. In the event of military confrontation, the U.S. actually takes over the South Korean military and runs it itself effectively. Uh, so, uh, and when we see this election that just took place in South Korea and the Yoon government was dealt a crushing defeat so the people around the world see what's happening. And this latest uh, poll that just came out of Singapore's uh, Yusuf Ishak uh, Institute said that whereas a year ago in the ASEAN countries, uh, the sympathy was much toward the United States. The trust was toward the United States, but was it 61% to 39%. Now it's toward China, 51% to 49%. So the world is seeing U.S. militarism and understanding increasingly how dangerous this is. The question is, are the American people going to see that? And what are they going to do in a choice between Trump and Biden? I mean, that's not what Americans want, but that seems to be the choice they're going to have. And those are sadly two different but terrible alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor Andrew Latham, uh, if we are undergoing this, uh, you know, profound transformation in the international framework, uh, you know, what's the right response? Is it about uh, having new blocks, a new security framework like AUKUS, like Quad, like, uh, you know, improved or reinforced U.S.-Japan defense relationship, or the new probably, you know, Washington, Manila, and uh, Tokyo uh, framework, all China, Russia getting uh, more closer? Is this the right response? Uh, no. No, I think a little bit more humility and a little less hubris or arrogance, if you if you will, uh, is in order on the American side. And we shouldn't be naive. Um, uh, states are pursuing their interests in ways that clash sometimes. The error that the United States has made and is making is that it thinks it can police the entire world, that the entire world of its is its sphere of influence, as it were. And um, that may have been possible. I doubt it, but it may have been possible once upon a time. It's certainly not possible now, because the other word that is in circulation now in, in our international relations world is multi-alignment, that a lot of the countries that used to be, take Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for example, staunch American allies, are now sometimes staunch American allies and sometimes working with China, for example, to resolve, uh, to affect that rapprochement with Iran. Um, China was the the helpful fixer. It wasn't the United States. Um, so I think uh, we shouldn't be naive. States are always going to pursue their interests, but one can do it, um, if we go back to Metternich, in terms of prudent balancing, not hegemony, which is just a nice Greek word for imperialism. Well, with that, we come to the end for today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.